Vicky Strong on VOA One, the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30 minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases, especially written, for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Katie Weaver and John Russell. Later, we will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, here is Katie Weaver. It takes years of research and testing to produce a vaccine. But scientists are hopeful that a technology called messenger RNA or mRNA, could produce a safe and effective vaccine against COVID-19 by the end of the year. The World Health Organization says there are 11 COVID-19 vaccine candidates currently undergoing Phase three trials around the world. The trials involve large groups of volunteers. Some receive the experimental vaccine, while others are given an inactive substance called a placebo. Among the most promising vaccine candidates are two that use mRNA technology. Those experimental vaccines come from American drug makers Moderna and Pfizer. Pfizer is partnered with German company BioNTech on the project. On Monday, November 9th, Pfizer and BioNTech announced that their mRNA-based experimental vaccine appears to be more than 90% effective in preventing COVID-19. The partnership said the early finding involved 94 volunteers in the trial who developed COVID-19. About 44,000 volunteers took part in the late Phase three study. An independent group of scientists called the Data Safety Monitoring Board examined the study. Pfizer and BioNTech also said that they found no serious safety concerns in the testing so far. They expect to seek emergency use permission from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration later this month. The agency requires a vaccine be at least 50% effective for emergency use. Dr. Anthony Fauci is the U.S. government's top infectious diseases expert. He called the safety result of Pfizer and BioNTech's study extraordinary. Not very many people expected it would be as high as that, he said. Dr. Bruce Aylward is a top advisor at the WHO. He said Pfizer's vaccine could fundamentally change the direction of this crisis. Two days later, Massachusetts-based Moderna announced that it is preparing to send its Phase three study to the Data Safety Monitoring Board. Moderna said it has more than 53 cases of COVID-19 infections out of 30,000 volunteers. Fauci told the Financial Times that he expected good results from Moderna's study because the two mRNA-based vaccines are identical in many respects. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention says vaccines usually contain an inactive or weakened virus. Vaccines introduce a virus to the body to force the production of antibodies that fight the virus. 
both Pfizer and Moderna's vaccines are made with mRNA technology. They do not contain the coronavirus itself. To make an mRNA vaccine, scientists create a genetic material that directs the human body to produce antibodies that can recognize and destroy the coronavirus. No mRNA product has been approved to treat people. Research in the technology started nearly 30 years ago. In 1990, University of Pennsylvania scientist Catalin Carrico proposed using mRNA technology in gene therapy. At the time, the technology was difficult to work with. When she injected lab mice with the genetic material, some died. Carico worked with colleague Drew Weissman. They made a critical discovery in 2005. They replaced one of mRNA's four chemical building blocks with a slightly modified compound called pseudouridine. Weissman said, we submitted that for a patent, and that was the birth of therapeutic RNA. I'm Katie Weaver. The United States plans to send Coast Guard ships to waters in the Western Pacific, commonly patrolled by Chinese ships. Experts say the move is aimed at strengthening U.S. efforts to contain Chinese expansion in the area without inviting a heated conflict. The Coast Guard is planning to deploy fast response cutter ships in the Western Pacific to protect the interests of America and its partners, National Security Advisor Robert O'Brien said in a statement last month. The Coast Guard says its fast response cutters are designed to deploy independently to carry out activities including port waterways and coastal security, fishery patrols, search and rescue, and national defense. A spokesman for the Department of Defense's U.S. Indo-Pacific Command said this week the timing for the Western Pacific operations is still being planned. O'Brien said Coast Guard ships will check for any illegal or unreported fishing that threatens our sovereignty as well as the sovereignty of our Pacific neighbors and endangers regional stability. China has the world's largest distant water fishing operation, involving an estimated 4,600 ships. Chinese enforcement ships do not always follow the ship's movements, Coast Guard Commandant Carl Schultz said last month. But, he said, the U.S. deployment plan is not just about fish. Experts say increased U.S. Coast Guard activity will also show China that the U.S. is prepared to check Chinese activity without risking conflict by using Navy ships. Coast Guard ships are largely seen as defensive, while Navy ships are built to launch attacks. It looks tamer than the Navy, but it also signals resolve to confront China, said Alan Chong, a professor 
at the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies in Singapore. The Coast Guard, Chong said, is a way of signaling presence without running the risk of triggering a shooting incident. Under President Donald Trump, the U.S. government has increased the number of short U.S. Navy ship visits through parts of the disputed South China Sea. U.S. officials say the ships were sent to carry out freedom of navigation exercises. Such operations are meant to show military force and support free movement of shipping in international waters. I'm Brian Lin. You may have heard or read news stories about the recent elections in the United States. The voting ended last Tuesday, November 3rd. That night and in the days that followed, Americans and people all over the world watched the news for election results. These news stories will be the subject of our Everyday Grammar Report today. We will explore part of English grammar that is important to understanding stories about elections. Phrasal verbs. Phrasal verbs are groups of words. They combine a verb and another short word, as in the term look up. Look up means to search for information in a book or on a computer. Here is something important to remember. Phrasal verbs have a meaning that is different from what the individual words suggest. After the U.S. elections, you probably heard or read many phrasal verbs in news stories. Today we will consider three of them. Go on, pick up, and catch up. The first phrasal verb is go on. In the hours after election day, many Americans asked themselves, what is going on with the election results? According to language expert Norbert Schmidt, go on is the most common phrasal verb in the English language. Go on has several meanings, but by far the most common is happening or taking place. Schmidt estimates go on has this meaning over 60% of the time that it is used. So how was go on used in stories about the election? Consider these words in a story from CNN, the U.S.-based broadcaster. CNN's website published the report at the end of last week. Six states remain too close to call. Here's why the vote count is still going on in key states. In other words... The writer wanted to explain why the vote count is still happening in six states. The second phrasal verb is the term pick up. For our program today, pick up is somewhat unusual. This is because its most common usage has little to do with its meaning with respect to elections. Schmidt estimates that around 70% of the time you hear or read pick up, it means to get or take somebody or something from a place. So, you might pick up or lift a stone from the ground. But with respect to elections, pick up has a different meaning. You might read about a political party trying to pick up votes in a congressional district or legislative area. Pick up, in this case, means to earn or gain something. It does not mean to get or take something from a place. Consider this example from The Guardian newspaper. 
It describes how the two main political parties are fighting for control of Congress. The Republicans looked to pick up a handful of seats in the House of Representatives, with Democrats holding the majority. Our third phrasal verb is catch up. Often, catch up describes what happens in a race when someone who is behind reaches the person in the lead. So you might hear someone at a motor car race say, "Driver A is catching up." To driver B, this same idea is true in elections. Candidates look to catch up, but they catch up in terms of votes, not in terms of distance. One CNN report used the phrasal verb "catch up" to describe results in the presidential race between former Vice President Joe Biden. And President Donald Trump. Joe Biden is not only winning, meaning building his lead, but that lopsided advantage makes it harder and harder, more difficult by the vote count for Donald Trump to catch up," said CNN's John King. Today we explored phrasal verbs that are often used in reports on elections. Understanding these expressions will help you understand such stories. Try using the phrasal verbs we talked about the next time you write or speak English, and be sure to listen carefully for them when watching the news. Little by little, phrasal verbs will become clearer and easier for you. I'm John Russell. <laughs> Welcome to the Making of a Nation: American History in VOA Special English. The Civil War began in 1861 as a struggle over the right of states to leave the Union. President Abraham Lincoln firmly believed that a state did not have that right, and he declared war on the Southern states that tried to leave. Lincoln had only one reason to fight: to save the Union. In time, however, there was another reason to fight: to free the black people held as slaves in the South. Today, Kay Gallant and Harry Monroe continue the story of how President Lincoln dealt with this issue. Lincoln had tried to keep the issue of slavery out of the war. He feared it would weaken the Northern war effort. Many men throughout the North would fight to save the Union. They would not fight to free the slaves. Lincoln also needed the support of the four slave states that had not left the Union: Delaware, Kentucky, Maryland. And Missouri, he could not be sure of their support if he declared that the purpose of the war was to free the slaves. Lincoln was able to follow this policy at first, but the war to save the Union was going badly. The North had not won a decisive victory in Virginia, the heart of the Confederacy. To guarantee continued support for the war, Lincoln was forced to recognize that the issue of slavery was, in fact, a major issue. And on September twenty-second, eighteen sixty-two, he announced a new policy on slavery in the rebel Southern states. His announcement became known as the Emancipation Proclamation. American newspapers printed the proclamation. This is what it said: "I, Abraham Lincoln, President of the United States and Commander in Chief of the Army and Navy, do hereby declare that on the first day of January, 1863, 
all persons held as slaves within any state then in rebellion against the United States shall then become and be forever free. The government of the United States, including the military and naval forces, will recognize and protect the freedom of such persons and will interfere in no way with any efforts they may make for their actual freedom. For political reasons, the proclamation did not free slaves in the states that supported the Union, nor did it free slaves in the areas around Norfolk, Virginia, and New Orleans, Louisiana. Most anti-slavery leaders praise the Emancipation Proclamation. They had waited a long time for such a document. But some did not like it. They said it did not go far enough. It did not free all of the slaves in the United States, only those held by the rebels. Lincoln answered that the Emancipation Proclamation was a military measure. He said he made it under his wartime powers as commander-in-chief. As such, it was legal only in enemy territory. Lincoln agreed that all slaves should be freed. It was his personal opinion, but he did not believe that the Constitution gave him the power to free all the slaves. He hoped that could be done slowly during peacetime. Lincoln's new policy on slavery was...